Well, now that we've had two solid days of USUB under our belt, we're ready to move on and tackle some other really wild integration techniques. Tonight we're going to focus on natural log integration. It's a little bit misleading. It kind of makes you think that we're going to be integrating functions with the natural log already in them. Just the opposite. We won't see any natural logs in the original problem, but there will end up being natural logs in our answer, believe it or not. And just as a general theme throughout all of our integration, you know, I, I thought this was a fitting statement. He said, you know, when we derive, it's more like, you know, here's the question, what is the answer? And then we just turn that completely around when we integrate. It's almost like Jeopardy almost, you know, they give us the answer and we need to develop the question. And I think, uh, you know, it helps me a lot of times when I'm doing a problem like, you know, maybe the integral of cosine perhaps. I try to ask myself, well, what did I just take the derivative of to get cosine as my answer. And that's usually what helps me remember, uh, you know, especially when it comes to getting the right signs, whether it's a positive or negative. Well, my first question for you today is, do you remember the one exception for the power rule? And uh, maybe this hasn't been a burning question on your tongue, but perhaps it has. Uh, you know, when, back when we did the integration here, we said, you know what, when we integrate a normal polynomial term, we're going to add one to the exponent, and we're going to divide by the new exponent, and, you know, throw our plus C on there. But there was an exception. We said, you know what, n can be any number in the world except for the fact that n's not allowed to equal what? Yeah, it wasn't allowed to equal negative 1. So today we're actually going to address that problem. What happens if n is equal to negative 1? How do we integrate x to the negative 1? Or in other words, how do we integrate 1 over x with respect to x? That is the question we're going to tackle today. So perhaps uh, you already got a really good idea of, of how to integrate 1 over x. And again, it goes back to the idea, what did I derive to get 1 over x as my answer? And hopefully you're sitting there saying, hey, it's, it's the natural log of x. Of course, we don't want to lose our plus c anytime we have an indefinite integral. And what we're going to do today is we're going to slap absolute values around that x um, value as um, just a standard procedure type of thing. Because... It's kind of like a safety net. Uh, you know, we can't take the natural log of a negative number, and so we just want to make sure that we're not inheriting any negative values. Then the more generalized version is 1 over u with respect to u, and that's going to be the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. Uh, a lot of times this expression right there, I'm going to condense it and just say du over u. That's our big, you know, that's what we're going to continuously see today. You'll notice, check out the location of the u. Where is the u? And that leads us into our next statement. Probably at least 90% of the time, we're going to let u equal the what? The denominator. So anytime you're integrating a fraction, my first thought is to let u equal the denominator. Our first one tonight is going to be a real cupcake here. Um, I want to talk about how to integrate 2 divided by x with respect to x. Now just take advantage of one of your properties. One of your properties says that we are allowed to pull you know, any multiples or coefficients out front. So I'll just slide the 2 out front and now it's really just 1 over x with respect to x. So the antiderivative is going to be 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Again, just like any time you finish integrating, you could take your answer take his derivative and see if it matches the original problem and it's a great way of checking your solution. The second example tonight, we'll buzz through a couple here real quick. Let's take a look at 3x squared plus 1 divided by x cubed plus x. So we just want to develop some good habits here. Anytime that they ask you to integrate a fraction, your first thought is to let u equal the denominator. And and basically, um, you know, u sub is really going to carry us through all of the techniques we learn over the next two to three weeks. That's going to be the foundation. And so we're going to, again, take the derivative of u with respect to x. And I automatically move the dx over, just like we've always have. And then I'm going to divide, you know, I'm going to solve for dx and divide the 3x squared plus 1 over. And then we'll just sub everything back in. And let's see, this became, we got 3x squared plus 1 all over u times du all over 3x squared plus 1. And you are anticipating this. We've got a great cancellation. We've killed all the x's. Everything is exclusively in terms of u. And we can say the antiderivative is the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. And we'll just rewrite it so it's in terms of x. And it's the natural log of the absolute value of x cubed plus x plus c. Our third one tonight is one of those ones where the theme is really all about the coefficients. Can you keep a handle, can you keep an eye on all of the coefficients here? 
because uh, history tells us, you know, if we do run into any careless mistakes, it's going to be because we got careless with the coefficients. So here we go. We're going to, again, we see fraction. We're thinking let u equal the denominator. And his derivative is just going to simply be a 4 times a dx. And as we solve for dx, we'll divide the 4 over. So we're really integrating what? 1 over u. And then for the dx, I'm going to substitute the du over 4. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to slide the coefficient of 1 fourth out and rewrite it as the integral of du over u. And the antiderivative of, let's see. And we got the natural natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. And uh, boy, how many times have you yelled at yourself for forgetting that plus c? Just it's you know, just a lot of muscle memory and good habits. And let's see, that's, uh, what was that? Our u was 4x minus 1. Okay, so there it is. And again, another really easy function to derivate. You know, take his derivative and see if it leads you back to the original problem. Well, here's a really common question, and basically it's the exact same thing we've been doing, um, but just kind of tucked into a word problem. They want me to find the area of the region bounded by the graph of y equals, uh, we've got x all over x squared plus 1. All right, and that region's bounded by not only that function, but it's also bounded by the x-axis and the vertical line x equals 3. So wait a minute, what's missing? Well, what's missing is they only gave me one vertical line. And so you're sitting there, we're pondering the question, what exactly are my bounds? You know, the first question is, you know, is 3 going to be the lower bound or the upper bound? You know, and then who is the other one? Well, the, what, what, what we've got to do is we've got to take a look at the graph. And the graph, uh, once we identify the specific region in play, is going to reveal who the bounds should be. And um, so in order to do that, I'm going to bring this graph here I had sitting there. So here's a graph of that particular equation and if you analyze the region here that is strictly bounded by the curve, the x-axis, and the line x equals 3, we've, we're referring to this nice region here, and the shaded region starts at x equals 0 and so that's kind of an implied bound. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to set up an integral where 0 is the lower bound because that's where the region starts and then 3 is the upper bound because that's where the shaded region ends. And then the function is simply going to be the curve, x over x squared plus 1. Now in order to evaluate this definite integral and to find that exact area, we're going to do, we're going to let u equal the denominator. And good time here to hit the pause button, run through it, and see what you end up with. All right, going to solve for dx, and so I divide the 2x over. Now again, the bounds need to change, and the new lower bound is going to be a 1, and the new upper bound is going to be a 10, and all I did is I substituted those bounds into that x and evaluated that expression. And so we've got x all over u and du all over 2x. Now we're going to kill the x's, but do not lose sight of that coefficient. Our new coefficient is going to be 1 half. And so we've got 1 half times the natural log of u with bounds of 1 to 10. And so it's going to be the natural log of 10 minus the natural log of 1. Now because we've spent so much time drawing that beautiful natural logarithmic graph, you know that when x equals 1, the function has a value of 0. So it's just 1 half the natural log of 10, and they could disguise that and say maybe the natural log of radical 10, and that represents the exact area of the curve we had above. Well, certainly no lesson would be complete if we didn't have a, a good example with some trig sprinkled in there. Let's take a look at secant squared over tangent. And uh, some of you may see this right away, that this one is tailor-made, absolutely tailor-made. And our first thought, as soon as we saw the fraction, we said, you know what, I'm going to try letting u equal the denominator and just see where it takes me. And, um, you know, and, and you'll hear me say this a hundred times, I think one of the great traits of all uh, that all great mathematicians have in common is the fact that their, their brain's kind of thinking two or three steps ahead of their, what their pencil's putting on paper. And so as you're letting u equal tangent, you're already imagining the fact that his derivative is secant squared. And that as you substitute uh, du over secant squared in for dx, you can visualize that cancellation taking place. Right? here. You, you could have, and I want you to get to that point where we, we do so much practice and so many reps that you can feel that cancellation coming before it actually happens. And then the antiderivative of du over u is of course going to be the natural log of the absolute value of u. 
And we'll rewrite that in terms of x, and we've got the natural log of the absolute value of tangent of x plus c. Here's a great one for you to uh, certainly try on your own. It's got a little wrinkle in it, but I don't think it's anything that you guys can't overcome. So why don't you go ahead and try this rascal all on your own and see if you can overcome the, the, the little mini obstacle that you do encounter. All right, here we go. I let u equal the x squared plus 2x, of course, and his derivative was 2x plus 2. And then uh, we solve for dx, so I got t du over 2x plus 2. Okay, so we've got x plus 1, and, and I feel a little uncomfortable here because my du is being divided by 2x plus 2, and, and you know, on the surface, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to make a cancellation. But what you notice here is we do have a GCF, and we can factor out our 2, and once you factor out the 2, we do reveal the binomial x plus 1. So now I got a coefficient of one half to be pulled out, and I've simply I've got it in the form of du over u, and that was certainly my goal. Anytime we have a fraction, is to get that integral in terms of du over u, whose antiderivative is the natural log of u plus c, and one half the natural log of x squared plus two x plus c. All right, the next one I've got for you here is a really interesting. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, got to move the screen. There we go. All right. I want to talk about integrating tangent. Now, if you go back and look at the, the first time we integrated trig functions, we did have six on the list, but integrating tangent was not one of them. We certainly know how to derive tangent, but up until today, we've never integrated tangent. And in order to make this happen, I want you to think of the quotient identity that you've put on your bite-sized quiz several times. And so I just want you to rewrite it as such, and now... I bet you'll see that we're going to let u equal cosine. And you can see why we couldn't really do this integral up until today. Today was the magical day where this now becomes, oh my goodness, what did I just forget, guys? What did I just forget? Yeah, I forgot that little negative sign there. So go ahead, divide the negative sign over. Okay, and we'll make our substitution. We've got sine all over u, du all over negative sine. Do not, do not lose track of the negative sign. In fact, go ahead and just pull it out front right now. We don't want to get careless and lose that rascal. And so we're integrating du over u. And I've got negative natural log of u, which in this case was cosine. Now, this is certainly an acceptable answer. The other thing you could do, because it's a log function, is uh, the coefficient could move to the exponent. So we could say natural log of cosine to the negative 1 power. And that's uh, cosine to the negative 1 is just going to be secant. So a lot of times I'll use the natural log of secant just because it's a positive uh, function to work with and I, you know, I don't have to get uh, bogged down with that darn negative sign. Well, before we wrap up tonight, I wanted to sneak in one more mini topic tonight and uh, we call this using the first fundamental theorem to solve what's called an initial value problem. And um, it sounds like a lot of gibberish right now, but first I want to recap what our first fundamental theorem was. Okay, The first fundamental theorem said, hey, if, if you integrate little f, you know, from a to b, okay, what you get is you get the antiderivative, okay, and what we're going to assume is that capital F is the antiderivative of little f, and you would plug in your b, and then you would plug in your a and find the difference of those two values. Now, there's a lot of different notational things we could use. Now, for instance, if I said that I was integrating f prime, you know, from A to B, then notationally speaking, who would we say is his antiderivative? We'd say it was little f, you know. So you don't let the notation bother you so much as long as you know that this function over here is the antiderivative of this function here. And again, just make sure we're plugging in the upper bound before we plug in the lower bound and find the difference. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to use this first one out theorem in a very interesting way and uh, certainly going to take some practice to get used to. But, uh, you know, take a stab at them and see if you like them. So here it is. Here's our big question tonight. And uh, certainly take the time to, to, to write this down as carefully as you can. But basically they're saying, okay, hey, if f prime equals 2x, and we told you that f of 2 is equal to 5, could you find f of 6? Do you think we've got enough information to find f of 6? So here's how we're going to attack this. And first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remind myself of what the first fundamental theorem looks like. If we're integrating the function f prime, 
with bounds uh, from A to B, that would be equivalent to his antiderivative evaluated at B minus his antiderivative evaluated at A. So that's the setup. Now, interestingly enough, let's see, and uh, for F prime, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to substitute the 2x in for F prime because that was given to us. Now, A and B are going to be the bounds. Now, we happen to know what 2 is, and we want to know the value at 6. I'm going to let 2 be my lower bound and 6 be my upper bound. And uh, the first fundamental theorem says that will be equivalent to f of 6. Remember, f's the antiderivative of this function, minus f of the lower bound. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up that left side. All right. Um, let's see. The, it's going to be x squared with bounds of 2 to 6. And that's going to equal f of 6 minus. Now, what do you know about f of 2? They already told us that f of 2 was equal to 5, so I'll substitute that in. Now, on the left side, I'm going to plug in my 6 minus my 2, and that's going to equal to f of 6 minus 5. So it's just a lot of number crunching right now. Uh, we've got 12 minus 4, which is 8. And the last thing I'm going to do is add the 5 over, and we've just proven that f of 6, this isn't even an estimation, folks, this is an exact value, f of 6 must be 13. And, um, you know, I haven't even really worried about what the function f of, a, f of x looks like, I just know that f of 6 is equal to 13. Now I'm going to try one that applies to what we've tackled today with regards to integrating du over u. So here's a pretty wild looking one. It looks worse than it really is. But they said, hey, if the derivative of a function is 4 over x, and we told you that f of e equals 2, do you think you could find f of e squared? Now you think that they're making your life harder by throwing these e's and e squareds at you, but believe it or not, they're actually making your life a lot easier. And you won't really be able to appreciate that until you see what the antiderivative is. But anyway, so I would go set up my first fundamental theorem. Now, the reason they call it an initial value problem is because this right here is called the initial value. They're telling you some characteristic or a specific point that f has to pass through. So I'm going to set up my first fundamental theorem, and I'm going to say, well, the integral of f prime, which is 4 over x, with a lower bound of e, because that was the given value, and upper bound of e squared, because that's the desired unknown value, that's going to equal f of e squared minus f of e. And again, you'll notice the pattern. I've totally patterned everything I wrote right off the first fundamental theorem. Uh, my antiderivative on the left side is going to be 4 times the natural log of x. And I'm not even going to worry about the absolute values because I know both numbers that I'm going to plug in are already positive. So the absolute values aren't really necessary. And that's going to equal f of e squared minus, and remember they already told you f of e was equal to what? Yeah, 2. All right, we're going to clean up the left side just by plugging in the, the upper bound. So I've got 4 times the natural log of e squared minus 4 times the natural log of e equals f of e squared minus 2. All right, now we get to use our zap rule right here. We know that uh, these offset, that's really equal to 2. So 2 times 4 gives me an 8. Minus, okay, that's 1, so I got 4. And then I'm going to add this 2 over to the other side and just do a little bit of house cleaning. And e minus 4 is 4, 4 plus 2. We got 6. So f of e squared turned out to be 6. So just a little application of the first fundamental theorem. And uh, these last two problems, uh, what we've done is something that's really going to show up a ton on the AP exam. And uh, we'll practice this continuously throughout the year. So I hope you had a good night, and we'll catch you tomorrow.